Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. <laughs> I heard there were tequila shots at the party last night. Anybody? Yeah, a few people? OK, great. <laughs> well, it's my pleasure to introduce the keynote presentation for this morning, which is a panel. My name is Sylvia Jensen, and I head up marketing for Acquia and EMEA. I'm based in the UK, um, and despite my accent, I've actually lived in Europe for uh, many, many years now. So I've been at Acquia for about 10 months. And when I say 10 months, that sounds like a very long time, but I honestly feel like I joined yesterday, like I just walked through the door yesterday. There have been so many changes with the people, with the processes, with the products. It's just been a whirlwind, but a, a very, very fun ride. As I uh, stand here before you at this event, I'm almost embarrassed to say this is my first big Drupal event. So many of you have been coming to these events for years and have so many wonderful stories and experiences to share. I mean, I've been hearing about Drupal Europe since I think the day I started. It's been a very big thing on our radar. Um, but as a newbie, and I am a newbie to the industry, I am very, very impressed with this event. So I know we celebrated very much yesterday everyone who helped put it on, but I definitely want to add my uh, congratulations because it's been, it's been a fantastic week so far and I, I know there's more to come. Acquia is a proud sponsor of this event, obviously, um, but we also, have, in the short time I've been here, also sponsored a number of Drupal camps in London, in Alicante, and in Lisbon, and probably even some events that I'm not aware of. And uh, again, it's been a very nice experience, but what I, it, what I didn't realize, what I didn't appreciate was the passion and the hard work that the community puts in. I know to do this event has been a journey, and if it wasn't for the community, it couldn't happen, and I'm just very impressed. It's just been, a, a, again, a very impressive event, so thank you. As part of the community, and Acquia as part of the community, we also contribute. So I just wanted to get up here and say, you know, please come by our stand if you haven't already come by. At Acquia, we help brands create moments that matter for their customers with reliability and scalability on Acquia's Drupal hosting. So if you haven't come by, please come by the stand. We'd love to speak to you. And with that, Tim, I'll hand it over to you. Let's see. So um, we're here today to talk about uh, a couple of topics that are near and dear to really everyone here, everyone who could be here in person and everyone who's uh, at home in their hotel rooms watching the live stream right now, um, <laughs> nursing their headaches. Um, but uh, the reason we want to come together today is that Drupal is one of the largest open source projects in the world. And not, are, not only are we one of the largest open source projects in the world, we are often uh, hosts to other projects who come to join our events. At the Open Web Lounge, we have representatives from a number of other projects who have come here today. Um, and we want to talk about how communities like ours have a responsibility to think about the future of, of the open web in particular and of open source and understand the difference between these two concepts and where they intersect. Um, so I'd like to start with some basic introductions before we dive into our questions. Um, and I'll start with myself as the moderator. So I'm Tim Lennon. I'm the interim, director, interim executive director for the Drupal Association. Um, and uh, let me pass it on to Heather. Morning. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this model? No, it's good. There we go. uh, morning, I'm Heather Burns. I'm a tech policy and regulation specialist. I'm from Scotland. And I work with policymakers and digital businesses, including open source projects, to shape the regulations which dictate how we work. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, Barb Palser, I'm on the global product partnerships team at Google in a relatively new role uh, focused on working with large content platforms and ecosystems to improve open web performance and make the web uh, a, a better place for both uh, content creators as well as content consumers. My role at Google, in fact, my, my employment at Google is relatively recent. Um, it's been about a year or so. Um, prior to that, my entire career has been in local news and local media CMS. And so from that perspective, I'm really interested and passionate about making the open web a viable and sustainable place for quality journalism. Great, welcome. Okay, Heather, 
Okay, there we go. Good morning. My name is D.B. Hurley, and I am the founder of an open source marketing automation platform called Demotic. And uh, we've been around for about four years, and we're growing rather rapidly in the space. And uh, we work really well with Drupal. <laughs> All right, this is always a bit odd. Uh, but my name is Dries, um, <laughs> and I'm very passionate about open source and the open web. Um, obviously, started the Drupal project, also co-founded Acquia. Um, about, that's about 11 years ago, so. All right. So to kind of kick us off, um, I'd like to ask Heather to uh, introduce to the audience and to our panel kind of definitions of what, it, of what the open web means and what open source means, how those concepts are interconnected, and how they might be um, separated in some ways, um, and also perhaps to touch on some current events. Well, we all obviously work in open source software, regardless of what content management system or application or platform it is. And I think we're all very familiar with the four open source freedoms, which is the freedom to run, the freedom to study and change, the freedom to redistribute, and the freedom to distribute. But we all do those things on the open web. And there really isn't a definition of what the open web is or what it looks like, and it can be many, very, many very different things to different people. But loosely put, what makes the open web what it is, is what I would call the ability to access it, to get online, basically, the ability to use it, which requires a certain amount of social and technical knowledge, and yes, some financial resources, the ability to code, the ability to publish, and the ability to deploy. So it's the ability to use the internet to build and make something. And the four freedoms of open source software if you think about it, are only one aspect of that. Those are the abilities to code. But while we've done some fantastic work, and this conference is proof of it, in building open source as a community, as an ecosystem, we really haven't paid as much attention as we should to the health and the stability of the open web. And even just literally on the plane here yesterday, some of the fundamentals that make the open web what it is changed. And there are a number of issues, um, some are political, some are social, that I believe that all open source communities need to start paying closer attention to and advocating to keep the web open so that we can continue to enjoy the four software freedoms and our, our, our open source projects. Thank you, Heather. Um, so we're going to kick off with a variety of questions for our panelists and encourage them to debate with each other. Um, I do want to start with you, Dries, which is, um, kind of responding to Heather's definition of what the open web is, can you talk about what it means to you and how our philosophical principles around the open web dictate the technology that we create together? <coughs> yes, I'm happy to. Um, well, I liked your definition, Heather. Uh, thank you. Um, for me, it is that, but also um, something, I don't know, bigger, but more maybe, which is, is a movement. You know, for me, the open web is also a movement which is an important movement because it goes up against some of the largest platform companies in the world that have a lot of control over our data um, and that really um, you know, could, could basically change the perspective of things in society. And we're seeing that happen with Facebook and you know, obviously the American government. <laughs> I think everybody has, has been following that story. And that's a great example of some of the, I think the challenges that we face with the walled gardens and the closed web, and for me the open web is, you know, all of the things that Heather said, but also this bigger movement to, um, you know, keep the web distributed um, so that we don't have some of these, you know, some of these challenges. Um, so I forgot the second part of your question. Uh, the um, second part was, how do you think that that your personal commitment, perhaps, to the concept of the open mm -hmm. web influences our technical decisions in, our, in the projects that we do and in the organizations we partner with. Yeah, well, so first of all, I think open source has been a driving force for the open web. Um, so I think they're highly connected, and I think um, as it relates to technical decisions in open source or in Drupal specifically, I feel um, you know, that we need to make, uh, we want to build software um, that everybody can use. So that's accessible, that's open, that's easy to use. Um, 
And so therefore, I think all the technical decisions need to be made in that context, meaning we need to keep things open, right? And there's really very little advantage to us to, to use sort of like closed, you know, closed solutions in an open source product. So um, I think we want to align these two visions. I mean, I think they're inherently aligned um, already, but I think we want to keep it that way. Great. So um, I promised the panel that I wouldn't uh, start a fist fight, <laughs> but um, I am going to throw a couple hard questions. And the next one is for you, Barb, because I think um, you know Google is uh, a massive organization, has uh, significant influence on what the web is and what it will continue to be by purely on the basis of market share. Um, and I think there's a lot of questions, concerns, or misconceptions about some of the initiatives that. Um, Google is pushing forward. So, for example, AMP, I know, is a topic that's controversial to many in our community. And can you speak a little bit to initiatives like Google's AMP project and how they intersect with the open web? Um, yeah, so I can use the rest of the hour to talk about that, right? Because <laughs> I feel like I need it to answer that question. Um, but I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep it succinct, um, and, and I, but I do want to answer it in two ways. Um, so specifically with regard to AMP, um, I, I'd like to describe the vision for AMP, so what we hope it becomes, um, which is a highly performant, well-lit path um, that uh, site owners and developers can use to build their websites. Um, so, and, and in order to do that, that's something we, you know, we would want that to be a choice, so we want the framework itself to be robust enough um, and full-featured enough and flexible enough that it makes sense to build your website with AMP, um, which is probably a very different description of it than many folks have heard, particularly if they are familiar with it early on. Uh, I think the fact that the way that uh, you know, AMP sort of first appeared uh, within Google search results, which was a, a logical place for us to begin surfacing it, kind of created the, the assumption that that's what it was intended to be. Um, a format for delivering your content in Google search. Um, or, or worse, folks, some folks think of it as a way to game search. That's not it at all. Um, it, we wanted search to be a, certainly a, a surface where we could showcase AMP's performance, um, but what we really hope uh, is that publishers um, decide to begin to build with it as an exemplary format that shows what a more performant web could be. And if that ends up meaning that AMP itself sort of deprecates um, or is replaced by just general web performance standards, that would be awesome. Um, and so to that end, you know, there are a couple of things that are being worked on. Um, you know, one is uh, Google is pursuing uh, web standards that uh, would create, um, create the ability for us to display say your um, you know, non-AMP content in that Google search carousel, totally open to that if we can find a way to make it happen while the standards are still in force. Um, and then also working on those, those AMP cache URLs. I know that's also a very controversial thing. We would, are working on um, a technology using web packaging um, to enable publishers to securely sign their AMP pages so that they can be delivered from the publisher's URL. So um, again, there's, there's kind of a lot more to it, um, but you know, the purpose of AMP isn't to create some kind of walled garden format, it's quite the opposite. Um, the second, if you mind, the second way I'd like to answer that question really quickly <laughs> um, is um, in emerging markets where internet connectivity and bandwidth is slow and expensive, using the web is extremely painful. And so we are seeing in regions of the world, in India, for example, um, where there is a strong preference for AMP because non-AMP pages are often inaccessible or you know, they're so heavy and difficult to use that they're costly. So in other parts of the world, AMP is sort of a different thing than it may be in, you know, in say, a you know, developed 4G space where there are a lot more questions about it. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Thank, thanks for that kind of introduction from your perspective. And I think I'm going to jump around our agenda a little bit because I'd like to ask David to respond to sort of that conversation with, um, uh, with helping us understand the business ecosystem and the imperatives that the business ecosystem has and how those are or are not in conflict with these principles of open source and the open web. I think that we have seen 
as open source has grown and changed, um, a different approach to how to monetize or build business models around open source, particularly as in, in the earlier days, we would imagine that open source was the bits and pieces, and yet a company could build a business around putting those pieces together in a unique way and then offering that as a service um, or some other additional add-ons, things like that. And as we've seen technology change over these last 10, 20 years, uh, what we see is that there's not as much value in putting the pieces together uh, because now there are additional ways for that technology to be constructed and, and made easier and easier. And so there becomes more and more of a challenge of how to take something like open source and to utilize it in a way uh, to, to, to build business around. Fair enough. Um, so we've been walking a line, I think, reasonably between sort of positivity, but some vague concern. But I'm going to put the panel on the spot and ask for a show of hands. So who right now thinks that this philosophical commitment to the open web is winning today? All right. And so therefore, who thinks it's losing? OK. So um, that's a pretty stark response, considering how important we consider this uh, to be. Um, and let's speak to that a little bit more. Why do we think it's at risk? Um, Heather, would you like to talk? Um, we've always been sort of proud of the way that we are, open source projects are global, borderless, remote, casual, ad hoc, but that is not how the world that we work in is. The world we work in does have borders, it does have rules, it does have restrictions, it does have controversies that can't be hashtagged off under drama. Um, these things I think everyone is aware of is coming to a head. There are social issues such as data protection and privacy. There are political issues such as net neutrality, copyright, as we saw yesterday. And where this really starts to hit us hard is in acknowledging that the open source platforms and projects that we make have been abused through things like the automation of fake news, uh, the use of content management systems to take that a step further and use fake news to distort and interfere with electoral results and elections, things like bots that we don't know that the people we are interacting with are authentic and in fact have just been just cooked up through an algorithm specifically to react to a political issue. Um, it very, very much frustrates me that many open source communities believe that they still have the luxury of picking and choosing which issues we're going to work on, which issues we won't, or that we continue, can continue to look at these things purely as a matter of software rights. Mm -hmm. We do need to start speaking up for the open web so that we can continue to have open source projects. We are precariously close to having everything we do regulated. And that ultimately is the fault of some of the larger platforms. Every politician wants to go after Twitter and Facebook and, and yes, Google. But anything they do is going to rebound on us. And we need to start speaking up for our projects and defending them and the open web because change is coming, whether we like it or not. And I feel that open source is still very much in the, the phase of our maturity of going and sulking in the corner saying, oh, well, I don't want to deal with that. Well, we all have to start dealing with it. And I think we can, con can do it constructively and positively, but we have to do it the right way. Thank you. Would anyone like to respond to that point, Dries? Um, I, th I, th I think it's a great question. So I think I do, I do, too, I do believe that the open web is losing uh, as well. And so it's, for me, the, to answer your question, it, we c you could think, of why is the closed web winning, right? And then what do we have to do to... <laughs> to win as well. And so I think it's the closed web is winning because at the end of the day, they offer a better experience. Uh, and in my opinion, the best experience always wins. And 
uh, it's sad because it doesn't mean it's the best underlying solution or it's best for your privacy or it's best for all of these things. But like Facebook, people want to stay in touch with their friends. Facebook is the easiest and the best way to do it. And it's actually kind of like a reinforcing loop because of so much data. Because they have so much data, they can make the experience even better, right? And so if you, if you then kind of go to like, so how do we win? Well, one, we need to build experiences that are as good or better than Facebook's experience and probably need to be 10 times as good at this point to really you know, get billions of people to move over <laughs> to the open web. And that's really hard, right? And to get there, um, I think we have a, a lot more to, we have to figure out how we manage data and how we control personal information and how you make some of that available to, to algorithms in a controlled and thoughtful way <laughs> uh, versus you know, the way Facebook does it. Um, we need to build distributed protocols and, and all of these things on top of that. I think there's a lot of engineering that has to happen to build experiences that are better um, you know, than those provided by closed platforms today. Um, I also do think regulation is a big part of this, in my opinion, and I feel like our governments um, are falling short, quite frankly. I feel at, in the US, the government falls short. In Europe, the government falls short in trying to help uh, regulate uh, some of these things because I think if the government was to help in the right way, um, you would actually give the open web a chance to to step in <laughs> and and you know and start winning so i think there's a lot of technology work there's a lot of also you know work the government can help us with uh, david could you respond to perhaps how we might get there from where we are now to some of these ideas that might help sure the open web start to win i think it's i, th I think you make a very good point it, it, it for me as well is all about the experience and Oftentimes, from a developer standpoint, the technical part of it is the part that seems more interesting. And I think even in communities like, like we have here, the ability to be better technically is interesting and it is challenging and it's a problem that we feel we can solve well. And oftentimes that tends to lead to a little bit of neglect to the experience side. And usually I think what we see is for the vast majority of individuals, thing that compels them to use a platform or to use something is the way that it, it, they interact with it and the experience that they get from it. And so if we're not focused on, on how that adds value to them in a meaningful way, we are never going to be able to overcome that switching cost uh, if we look at it from a business perspective. And so the goal is to identify <coughs> not just the technical changes that need to happen or the improvements that can be made, but also begin to explore how we actually deliver an experience that's better, significantly better. Um, and I think that, that that becomes a a major focus that we should be looking at. We see it even in, if we look at current modern uh, blockchain and things like that, the concepts are, are very solid and strong and technically superior in many ways and yet the execution of them is still in, in the very early stages. The, ex the experience for the end user that's not familiar with this technology is, is very difficult. The, the, it's huge hurdles for them to overcome. So, uh, Barb, perhaps I'll ask you, um, how do you think that the kind of l larger existing players, these huge commercial players like Google, can help to move the needle in the direction of the open web as well? Yeah, um, so, so I'd like to, to, to start by elaborating, you know, kind of speaking about what, where, I, where, where, where I see some, you know, the, the, the threat and then, and then answer that question. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I'll reference again uh, emerging markets, um, parts of the world where users are coming online and where businesses are coming online. Um, and, and, you know, that new segment is enormous and it's not growing, it's not setting up shop on the web. Um, businesses and publishers who are coming online are creating their presence on Facebook, on Instagram, on e-commerce marketplaces, and I wanna be clear, all of those platforms are good, it's all fine, um, but it's concerning that they're not choosing the open web. And they're not choosing the open web because it's complicated, 
Uh, it's expensive, it's slow, it's clunky, all of those things. And then that has a, uh, you know, that then has an effect on the content available on the web. So, um, you know, again, doing a, doing a you know, search for a, you know, content on a particular topic, um, you know, here in the US, you get thousands and tens and thousands and hundreds and thousands of results. Um, the problem is there's, there's actually a lack of content, web content, in a lot of these emerging markets um, that would make it a worthwhile place to go to look for uh, a commerce transaction or content. Um, and so, um, you know, I think that's a, that's a big concern. Um, I wonder how that might affect the way that the rest, you know, the future of the web. Um, and then, you know, just so in terms of, you know, where, how Google's thinking about this challenge, um, a lot of our efforts are in those emerging markets. How can we, like, plant seeds and provide tools and make it easier for publishers to get on the web so that, you know, to, to your point, that they want to stay on the web, that they, you know, that they, you know, will maybe graduate from a very super simple experience to, to a website. Um, so, you know, that in itself is an opportunity. That means making content creation dead simple, <laughs> mobile optimized, um, both for the creator um, and the consumer, light and fast. Um, and, you know, guess what? All of those things are also really desirable things in the rest of the world, too. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, we've dwelled a little bit on, I think, the pessimistic side of uh, our understanding of where the open web is at. Um, but are, the, are there things right now that make you hopeful? Any trends that are coming online that you think um, uh, are a light at the end of the tunnel for this experience? Um, maybe Dries again, if you would. Um, I think there's a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I would maybe uh, react to Barb real quick, if that's okay. Yeah. Because you know, we give a hard time sometimes to companies like Google, but the flip side of, of that is also that Google helped bring billions of people to, to the web and continues to do so, right? So it's like this double-edged sword. And, um, and while we may have concerns about AMP, and I'm not an expert on this, but I also see Google trying to take the core concepts of AMP and trying to standardize them, you know, versus, you know, making them proprietary. And so I actually think Google could be a huge alley. I really, I really do believe. And, and Google needs the open web to win, frankly. <laughs> I mean, I'm not in charge of Google, obviously. <laughs> but Me either. Uh, they're ultimately an advertising business, and they need the open web to win so they can advertise on some of these websites. So that's hopeful, in a way. I, th I think Google is doing uh, a lot of good things. Um, you know, I'm actually encouraged um, by the indie web movement. Um, so I think one of the things we can do, we can talk about it all day long, but at the end of the day, a lot of us here are using Facebook. A lot of us <laughs> are using these platforms. And so in the beginning of the year, um, I decided to stop using Facebook uh, myself. Um, I think that's something that we all can do. And I've started to move a lot more stuff to my own site, right? And all of you should do that, in my opinion. <laughs> Um, you know, build your own site and get get off some of these platforms. And so, and I'm I'm seeing a lot more people do that. Actually, if I read blog post after blog post after blog post of people doing that, and there is a little bit of a renaissance happening in the indie web right now. You know, the people are getting together, starting to talk, starting to meet, and they're building, um, you know, interesting technologies uh, like Web Mention as an example. So we can connect independent websites together. And it's, you know, maybe I'm just nostalgic about it, um, but it's actually kind of cool because it, it reminds me of the old or the original web, you know, like 20 years ago, where we would be blogging on our own domains and we would be, you know, linking to each other, um, that kind of stuff. And so, you know, it's a little glimmer of hope, right? I mean, I'm not saying this is like, a tidal wave that's going to disrupt <laughs> uh, what we have today, but it's it's really encouraging to see that um, very often, um, what's the right term? Sort of the you know a lot of thought leaders actually in the space are s making the switch, right? The early adopters of something, uh, and to me it signals that a lot of the right people see that something is wrong, and that they're starting to lead and show others how it can be better. And so I think that's very encouraging. 
So I would actually agree with that. Um, I think that uh, maybe I tend to have some of the same nostalgia of the, the good old days of the early internet with the indie web. Um, I think that as we've seen the concept of where data ownership should lie and how that data ownership can actually be related to others, um, things like JSON linked data and things that allow us to have that linkage between um, different data sources is a huge positive that we're starting to see spread. In fact, Google as well has, in recent days, I think, done some great work in that initiative as well. Um, the ability to uh, have data live in different places and still be able to connect it in meaningful ways, I think, is a huge step towards moving off of um, third-party platforms. Yes. Um, to answer your question, one thing that open source software has going for it, which closed source platforms do not, is communities. Facebook and Twitter are ultimately companies that people work for. It's a day job. The people in this room, the people who have come here, the people who go to other open source conferences, we are communities. And we are growing and evolving from local meetups to local conferences to international ones to, for example, I don't know if Chris Teitzel's in here, but we're putting forth an idea for an open source consortium on privacy standards so that all of the major open source CMSs are not duplicating efforts and we're all sort of working on the same concepts, the sort, same code libraries, ultimately for the benefit of people who use our projects. Now, things like that are really test runs of how we can represent ourselves in society, in the open web, to defend it and represent it and support it. I think we're showing that we can grow from the little meetups to people who are worthy of a voice on a national and global stage, and it's up to us if we want to take that. And to, to add to that, actually, I mean, if you think, if you go back to it, like, how do we build an experience that's so much better than Facebook's experience, just as an example? It's really tough, right? Because Facebook has what you know, ten thousand engineers or something. <laughs> like, how do we compete with that R and D horsepower that a Facebook and a Google and others have? And what's really encouraging for me is that, as open source, we're starting to get there. Actually, you know, and, and in many ways, Drupal is is a leader in this. Like, we're showing the world how we can all work together with tens of thousands of us at the same time, and. That wasn't happening 10 years ago. And so it's kind of exciting to think about in another 10 years when the tools have evolved even more, you know, how many of us could actually effectively collaborate uh, on building things and how can we um, work together as projects and can we have an engineering force that is hundreds of thousands of engineers strong, if you will, you know, building on the same kind of, um, towards the same open web goal. I think we haven't figured out all of the pieces, obviously, but I think we're kind of on the right trajectory, which is uh, exciting. And I think that brings us really uh, neatly to the next topic, which is I'd, I'd like to ask the panel what you see as the key inflection points in the open web's history in the past and what might be upcoming in the future, what might be the major changes, whether technological changes, regulatory changes, or others that are going to have a big impact here. Um, so, for those of you who were on the nostalgia train uh, earlier, um, can you point to any moments um, in, a, in kind of the prior history of the web that were big milestones for... I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know how to answer, but I do remember we used to have, like, guest books. Remember this? Yeah. <laughs> like, yep. you could go to somebody's website and be like, sign my guest book. <laughs> 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 and we've lost that. Um, for me, that was a big loss. <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe I should bring that back on my site. Put guest um, module in core. There's a module for it. <laughs> <laughs> what about web rings? Come on. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, I, you know, looking back, I don't know. I feel like it's kind of creeped up on us slowly, one step at a time. Um, trying to think what some of these big moments are, but yeah. I don't know. I kind of slowly happened, I would say, a little okay. step by step. Um, I do think in the future, a big step could be when, you know, maybe some real legislation gets passed that really forces these big platform companies to do things differently. 
in a, in a way that allows us to compete more effectively around, um, and I, I'm, I'm guessing there might be something at some point around data. <laughs> mm -hmm. And if they're forced to manage data differently, it puts us on, um, I don't know if the word fair playing field is appropriate here, but sort of allows us to, to do things that we can't do today because we just don't have the data, right? And again, to build these experiences, the data matters. Like they're built on top of the data. And so not having the data um, puts us at a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. So I think that could change at some point or the disadvantage uh, diminishes vastly. Uh, and David, I know that you're involved in thinking about a lot of the future of the web and the, even the fundamental structure of the web as it becomes perhaps decentralized and things like that. Can you speak to some of those ideas and how they might impact this? Uh? Yeah, absolutely. I think that it's definitely, there are different ways in which we can see change happen. And I think you hit the nail on the head when you talk about where that data resides because there is so much value that's tied up in that. Um, if we talk, first of all, about what may be some inflection points or some changes, uh, I think that once there's some significant thought leadership around where we should be going in the future, that starts to raise the awareness of the topic. And that's really always that first step, right, is making sure that everyone is at least on the same page about this is where we are and this is where we should be. And being very cognizant as a society of these are the, these are the detriments of where we're at and this is the positives of where we could be, that begins to start that, that motion of, okay, we should be looking towards this new idea of the future. Um, then to cycle back to the idea of how we actually see that happen, um, it could be through legislation, absolutely. It could also be through um, a better understanding of data by the general population and the, the inherent value that's found in data. I think we're starting to begin to see that in, in just general culture. We're recognizing the value of our personal information a little bit more. But as that becomes something that we begin to see the tremendous amount of value, even the monetization opportunities that lie in that from an individual standpoint, uh, I think there begins to present itself an opportunity for something to come forward that uh, allows the individual to own their data and use that data for their own profit and use that for a monetization strategy for themselves as opposed to um, maybe a corporation. And so uh, I think you were talking, uh, when you talk about the decentralization of the web and the future things, uh, Tim Berners-Lee and the Solid Project, uh, which is one that I'm, I'm very familiar with and has spent a good bit of time with. Um, it basically gives the, the uh, control of the data to individuals so that they control their data and can pick and choose who that gets shared with and in what environment that gets shared in. Uh, so there's a, a lot of opportunity as we look at the future to explore different ways for um, software companies to build software um, kind of like they used to do, where it wasn't necessarily a, a data company with a software layer, but it's more so building software, building functionality, building algorithms um, that they can provide to a user and the user can then put their data into to gain value from. Uh, really separating the data from the software and allowing SaaS companies and software companies to build software applications, not necessarily collect data to do things with. Please. Just a qu very quick thought, which is, uh, you know, I believe that the open web is a decentralized web, right? And the original web was decentralized, and over time it got less decentralized. And I do think a lot of the recent technology trends are encouraging in that they're, um, you know, are, are making us, you know, help us to re-decentralize <laughs> a lot of the open web, like what's happening with blockchain and these kinds of things, actually are foundational technologies that help us build a stronger muscle, if you will, around decentralized technology. So that's also very encouraging. Heather, it sounded like you had a comment as well. I have a different question. Oh, ah. thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, you may have noticed when you asked the question, is the web winning or losing, like I wavered a little bit on both. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and that is because I, you know, I do see some really encouraging trends. And, and I agree, it may not be a moment, it may be more a series of trends. Um, but um, one of them is that uh, it seems that quality content and quality user experience um, are becoming aligned with um, business success for publishers um, and, and in, in a way that they haven't been for a long time. And uh, what I mean by that uh, is that up until relatively recently, I'll give a really specific example, advertising, right? Um, there was actually very little connect connection between, say, uh, programmatic advertising rates um, or uh, just advertising revenue and say the quality of a site or a user experience because there was a lot of opacity around performance and there were a lot of bad behaviors that proliferated like um, just you know tonnages of ads that were never actually seen by a human being at the bottom of the page and, and you know, I could go on and on. Um, and um, you know, I think that as we're maturing in our ability to measure and understand performance in a transparent manner, um, that will only favor quality publishers and quality user experiences. So we're understanding things like users, you know, when users bounce and abandon a website because it's a bad experience, um, or when you know, advertising is wasted dollars because it's never seen or never used. And then conversely, understanding how to design experiences that are actually good for both the consumer and in this example, say an advertiser or business interest. And again, I think that only helps quality publishers. So, um, and I think there's, there's versions of that trend kind of across, you know, across the space, but I think this alignment of quality and success um, is really exciting. Awesome. So at this point, um, I'd like to kind of begin an, an interactive component of this panel because we have a collection of experts in open source and the open web here, and I'm sure there are people out there who have questions. I'm gonna ask our panel one more question, but in the meantime, if you would think about anything that you would like to ask or any challenge you would might like to make to this panel, please begin thinking about that. Be prepared to raise your hand or come up to the front and line up so that you can ask a question. Um, and then once we get through this question, we'll be taking those. Um, so the last thing I would like to ask, and this is for each of you, um, is can you provide a challenge to the community that's in this room that you think would move the needle that would solve this problem? Dries, you sort of talked about yeah, it. Start blogging. <laughs> <laughs> or start using your own website and get off these platforms and, you know, you're all, a lot of you are developers, not all of you, but um, you can help make these things better, you know. Uh, there's a whole community, indieweb.org, I think it is, where some of these new things are being prototyped and developed, and it's actually very exciting, and uh, should bring some of these technologies to Drupal. Um, people are already working on that. Um, Swentel has done uh, a bunch of great work on a module, which is basically a collection of these indie web protocols that it implemented, um, and so yeah. Take a look at those would be my challenge, and then uh, get involved. I mean, with those things specifically. I would probably reiterate the idea that even though, again, most of us are probably developers or have that more technical mindset, consider the user experience, consider how the general population would be interacting with what we're creating, and identify how we can make that smoother and better in everything that we're doing. You totally stole my answer. Uh, but, I'll, but I'll elaborate on it a little, I knew, little I bit. I knew the fist fight was coming. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, you know, as, as we see, and I've been looking across, um, you know, not just uh, walled garden platforms, but also different types of CMSs, including commercial CMS platforms, and, and not, not suggesting remotely that, you know, a, an open source platform should turn into that. But one thing that those, um, some of those commercial platforms have become really good at is delivering a quality user experience. And if you look at which, you know, over the last 10 years, which platforms have grown and which have plateaued. Um, they may be small market share, um, but there are a lot of these sort of like site builder, you know, very easy to use, very user friendly um, platforms that are growing and growing um, because they're, you know, they're, I think they're thinking of that user first experience. They have to have that commercial orientation. And again, not suggesting that that's the right, you know, uh, suggesting, you know, so borrow, borrow that user first mindset in addition to the developer orientation. 
Um, to reiter reiterate what I said at the beginning, we're very good in open source projects at defining what we stand for in terms of software, in terms of the ability to code and deploy. We're not so good at defining what our projects stand for as principles. And I think to defend the open web, all of our projects need to start putting our mouth where our money is, is that the other way around? And defining what we mean. So if you believe your platform is about giving everyone a voice to speak their mind and have freedom of expression, you have to define what principles your project is going to stand for that create freedom of expression, whether that is, as we saw yesterday, the right to create links to who you want to, or to express a controversial political opinion, or again, as we saw yesterday, that your platform and project does then not become personally responsible for taking down terrorist content in the space of an hour. If you believe that your project is to give every prospective entrepreneur a shopping cart, you have to defend the conditions that allow them to do business in their country in the first place. And this can be tricky in open source projects because again, we're borderless and international and remote, and there's a real reluctance to get together and define what those things mean, but they are absolutely paramount for our survival as projects and for the survival as the open web. I often tell people that if you're not at the table, you're on the menu, <laughs> and all of our projects are on the menu right now, and that is by choice. We have to choose to show up at the table, and we have to choose what we're going to defend when we get there. Thank you. So we would like to turn it over to questions. Um, please raise your hand or come up to the front, and we'll find you with a microphone. Looks like we have one here. We can't see a thing, by the way. <laughs> hey, hello. Uh, thank you very much for the interest discussion I mean it I think it was very valuable for for every from for everybody um, question I mean everything is about community I mean I'm, I, that's a statement that it's like uh, it's in the it's in Drupal a lot and I was thinking what uh, what was the thing that changed the open source community back in the past I mean one of your questions and do you agree that actually creation of github and all this place of collaboration, uh, actually, this is like maybe the most significant uh, yeah, thing happened back in the past that actually enforced the open source communities. Okay. That's a good question. Sorry, I needed a mic. <laughs> um, yeah, I agree with you. I think, <clears throat> I think the collaboration tools that have been developed over the years have been massively impactful in the, in the growth. Um, of, of open source and in open source ability to, um, you know, to compete, I guess, with more complex, um, you know, software. I mean, I could, even in Drupal, that was a case. Like in the early days of Drupal, there was a mailing list. Uh, it was maybe 20 people on that mailing list and we would email patches to each other <laughs> on, the, on the mailing list. And so at some point that stopped scaling uh, to email patches. And so then we built our own sort of GitHub before GitHub, I guess on Drupal.org, and that really took us from maybe 20 people to, you know, thousands of people collaborating. And so tools matter, processes matter, all of these things help us be more organized um, and more efficient in how we all work together. So I think that was a very big deal for open source. Uh, hey, thank you also for this discussion. My question is, how do you think uh, New law, new laws like GDPR in Europe and similar attempts and that happen in the U.S. can affect the future of the open web. Heather. I think I'll take that one. Um, privacy regulation is coming in the U.S. There are a number of draft laws. Um, I'm actually, if you come to my talk this afternoon, I'm going to be talking all about it. The point we're making is that those rules are coming, whether we like it or not and it's incumbent on us to participate in the shaping of these rules. I do believe we have a very unfortunate passive aggressive habit of not participating, and then these rules come in that we don't always agree with or we struggle, and we're like, oh God, Europe telling us what to do, and, but we didn't show up to shape them to begin with. So we all have to accept the fact that there are some good rules some bad ones that are going to shape the way that we work, and we have to help shape them in our interests, but for the interests of the people who use our products and services, and we have to take a more positive, constructive approach to them. So, real quick, sorry. I, I also think that 
things like GDPR and anything that might come similarly in the US are incredibly valuable for, again, raising the awareness of data and the value that's found in it. Oftentimes, as consumers, we use a service because we appreciate that experience, because it's easy to use. And oftentimes, we neglect to think about what we're offering in exchange for access to that service. So things that increase the general population's awareness of the value that's found in their data and increases the just general discussion around the topic of privacy, uh, I, th I think is just inherently good. So that leads to, perfectly leads to my question, thank you. Because, so you talked about user awareness, and I think there used to be ad blockers, used to be a niche that some people knew about and installed, and now Firefox is putting in stuff to like block, uh, block trackers and things, and, like it's gonna, and, and it's becoming a default experience in multiple, um, multiple um, companies producing in their browsers. And also now that we see all the, the smartphones and, and smartwatches track your health data and your steps, and now you're more aware of all the things that are being collected about you because you get the value back about your data and you have more awareness of, oh, you, oh, you have all the data about me, so maybe it's, uh, hmm. So you get some, so that's a, a, an example where you are more aware of the data being collected about you being reflected on you. So do you have maybe other examples which could maybe lead you to understand this, the, the that is being collected about you and that you have, that you could have value in them? So I think one of the interesting ones that's um, coming up recently here, and again, we're in dipping into new tech, so it's not so widely known, are things like the Brave browser and the opportunity with the, uh, the um, what is it, the attention token. The idea that you can begin to monetize the, the data that you're offering to others. So I think that even though that's far, far on the cutting edge of side of things, not necessarily mainstream, we're beginning to see more and more examples of ways in which that data is not only being used, but also could be monetized. Yeah, just to add to that real quick, I, I'm actually encouraged about what's happening with some of the browsers. Um, you know, the fact that they're starting to build in app blocking and that kind of stuff and Brave browser. And I wish they would do a lot more you know, if you think about a browser, it's been kind of the same thing for 20 plus years. It's like this browser. <laughs> <laughs> and, but it could actually be a very useful tool more than just a, a viewport uh, to the world. Um, you know, what if every browser became a, a fact checking tool? You know, if you read something and you disagreed with it, you could be like, hey, I think this is wrong. And all of a sudden, maybe we, you know, all people in the world, so to speak, are enabled to help manage, you know, misinformation. You know what I mean? It's maybe yeah. not a good example, but so this Very idea that example. a browser becomes a lot more than just, you know, a simple tool to view pages, but that you can actually do um, a lot more with that. I would also love to, and maybe this is a bad idea, I haven't thought about it, but <laughs> I would love to, to tell my browser um, what kind of information I want to share and what, I mean, like every site I go to now I get a pop-up. You know, do you accept this cookie, yes or no? I mean, that's good, <laughs> but it's also a little bit annoying and I wish there was a more programmatic way for me to express my preferences in terms of how organizations can use my, my data, as an example. So browsers could innovate a lot, I think, and I hope they do. Any more questions? Ah, here we go. I think that browsers bring a really good point because when we discussed about software, I thought straight away, well, Internet Explorer 6 and then Chrome, and now I've moved to Brave about six months ago, and I had a look earlier, and it's blocked hundreds of thousands of things for me, and I think that that's really where we look at the experience. I, I don't see adverts on sites anymore. I realize maybe that affects their bottom line, but it brings my experience level up to the next level. And I think that's things that browsers have done. So in Explorer 6 was better than before. And then Chrome pushed browsers to be better. And I think Brave is now pushing them to be even better and give people awareness. And maybe they build in things for, I've seen the private tabs potentially linking in through Tor as well, um, because it's something that 
real users and not developers can easily get, and they get a whole bunch of stuff with it. So I think that that was maybe something from a, a real world perspective that they really use the open web through. Mm -hmm. um, so would you say that really it's the, the browser level that has to be where people are focused on for the open web and experience? All right, we maybe have time for one more question. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, so my question is regarding patents in the web. So for example, we have a lot of interesting developments also at Google with new uh, video encoding formats. And the problem that is just holding us back in the web is often and the situation was admittedly much worse in the past, that we cannot use technologies that already exist. And um, I was wondering how you see the development compared to the past um, of increasing cooperation between the major web browser developers so that we are enabled to use these formats openly. I'm sorry, could, could you repeat the first part of the question? Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, right now we have uh, a lot of video formats, audio, audio formats, or image encoding formats, and so on. They're all available and sometimes five times, ten times better than what we have right now. But we simply cannot use them because of, um, well, threat from the big companies to each other that we will sue each other. And um, I think this is holding us back in the web. Um, is there more cooperation now than in the past? What do you think? So, for example, in HTML5, we didn't have video for a long time just because people were afraid they'll sue each other. <laughs> okay, so, so, so in, in some aspects of that, you're getting a little, a little beyond my, my technical depth, and I might kind of hand this over, but, but, it, but, in, but in terms of the, the broad question around cooperation and collaboration, um, there, are, there are certainly areas where we see, um, where we see that happening more and more. Um, where, I mean, I think it's interesting, I think this actually this whole conversation is interesting in that in some ways we're talking about browsers becoming differentiated um, based on what they will allow the user to do and sort of being, you know, less just this neutral portal for viewing the web and, and kind of more sort of, a, you know, a, a, a you know, differentiated product in themselves. On the other hand, um, it does seem like um, the browsers are, um, you know, more and more trying to have cross-browser support of technologies um, right, so that we can create those experiences that we now all see, and this goes back to transparency, that we all see are actually better for a healthier web and better for all of us. Um, so I know, you, were you, did you get up on that? Mm. Okay. okay, great. Thank you very much. So I think with that, that's the end of our, uh, our questions. I'd like to thank all of our panelists for joining us. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. Um, and I'd like to thank you uh, for joining as well and for uh, just your commitment to be here to listen and to understand um, and to hopefully take some of these ideas about the future of open source and about the future of the open web back with you. So thank you.